want to go live. Can you still hear me like this, Malcolm, or is it not as good? No, it's, it's okay. It's okay at the moment. Yeah, it's okay. The pitch is sharp, but it seems to be it seems to be okay. Excellent. Okay. Good evening, then, to those of you who are on Facebook Live. Good evening yeah. to Malcolm, who's with us on Zoom. Good evening to those who are with me in person, and good evening to those who are going to join us at a different point on Tara Anytime. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Tara Anytime, for hosting this year. Tonight, we will discuss a few ideas. I have another share coming up soon, so we have to... I wouldn't say we have to be brief, but I don't think we can be as, as long as we normally are. So I'd like to start with the following. We have the mitzvah of Bikurim. We have the mitzvah of bringing the first fruits to up to Eretz Yisrael, up to Yerushalayim. There's Eretz Yisrael fruit, so we start off the, the first verse in the Pasuk in this week's Pasha, Perek Chofov, Pasuk Aleph, so when you come to the land, which God gives you as an inheritance, and you will, it, you will hold on to it, come your inheritance via Shaftava, and you will be living there. Then, you will take from the first of the fruits of the seven species which you bring from your land, put them in a basket, go to a place which God commands you to go there. You will come to the coin. That will be in those days. And you will say to him, I have said today to Hashem, and I have made this declaration to Hashem, it's because I've come to the land that Baruch commanded to our fathers to give to us. That is what we say, and then the coin takes it, and you have the whole thing. And as she says, you will say to him, says You want to prove with that that you are not somebody who is ungrateful and ingrate. That's why I'm saying it. So Rabbi Rucham says, we've mentioned Rabbi Rucham many, many times over here in this year, but he says a very important idea, and it's an idea that we need to realize has two sides to it, has two sides to it, and we're going to try to discuss both of those sides. So let me start with the following. Michael, you can, have you been home already tonight? Yes, have you had supper tonight? Did Laura make supper tonight? Yes, okay, so Michael has been home, he's had supper, and Laura's made supper, okay? I've also been home, my wife, though, went out to, to buy shoes, and I was in charge of making supper, so I'm not going to use myself just specifically tonight as the example, but in general, my wife's also the one that makes supper. So you come home, and you have supper, and supper's been delicious, or it's been not as good as it normally is, but whatever it is, let's say supper was delicious, and you're really happy with yourself, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you smile at yourself, and you think to yourself, my wife's great. My wife's amazing. I go out in the morning, I work hard all day, and I come home and there's a warm meal ready for me, a soup and a main course and maybe a salad and a side dish and even a dessert. And every night the same thing with all these bits and pieces. It's not so easy to do it, and she does it for me again and again. My wife is wonderful. Yeah? And you think that to yourself every single night. Yet you forget one thing. You don't tell her. Yeah? What is the reaction going to be at one point or another? Do you not want to say thank you? Are you not going to show some gratitude? To which you'll say, to what do you mean am I not going to show some gratitude? Do you know how much gratitude I feel in my heart for everything that you do for me? Do you know how my heart is bursting with pride every night when I come home and I see this beautiful, wonderful supper on the table? Do you know how I feel? What's she going to say to you? You never tell me. So what she'll say, but, but is it that important that I tell you? Why is it so important that I tell you? The answer is, we as human beings need to hear gratitude expressed to us. 
if people feel a sense of gratitude to you, but don't express it to you, then for all intents and purposes, as far as you're concerned, they've not said thank you. To which you can say, but, 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 I, of course, but, but I, I'm not ungrateful to you. I feel this great sense of gratitude, this debt to you for everything that you do. That might be, quite possibly. But you've not said anything. And if you don't say anything, then how am I supposed to know that that's how you feel? Gratitude needs to be expressed. To come to the base of Migdash with a basket full of Bikurim and just put it down and not say something, or even think to yourself, God, you're so nice. You gave me all these fruits. You're wonderful. If you don't express it, you don't say it yourself. You don't use your mouth to actually verbalize the words. Then within your gratitude, you're missing a real trick. Something big is missing there. And something that we need to learn. It's a very hard thing to do. It's hard to remember all the time to show gratitude. We, I mean, if you made yourself a list, imagine if you took out a list and you said, the people, the most important people in my life, what, you know, what am I gracious for? If I had to say, what do I have gratitude to my wife for? If I sat down now, if I was honest and I wrote a list, I'd be able to write a very, very long list. Then if I made another list, right? I've tried that once. Try this following. What are you grateful for? I'm grateful for my wife for the companionship that she gives me. And I'm grateful to my wife for the fact that she married me and that she gave me six children, that she takes care of those children so beautifully. And that she makes my meals and she takes care of my clothes and she makes sure that I look presentable and she does my laundry and I, I can keep going and going. Right? Make yourself a whole list of all the things that you have gratitude to your wife for. And then make yourself another column and write on top of that column, when was the last time I showed gratitude for that? You'd be very surprised. Because I feel this tremendous gratitude to my wife for all these great things that she did for me. And yet when I create another matrix on the other side to say to myself, when was the last time that I thanked her for it? Who knows? It could be a day. It could be a week. It could be a month. It could be months. It's a long time. And therefore, you need to realize that Gratitude is something that needs to be expressed. Even if you feel it. If you don't express it, not the same. Okay, so here comes the other side of this. This was why I said there are two sides to this, and I wanted to make sure that we took care of the other side of it as well. So number one is you say, you have to say thank you. You have to learn to say thank you, and it's something you need to teach your children. I remember there's a, uh, there's a shir that I listen to. There's a fellow that gives the shalom bai shirim, and he speaks about three A's that a husband has to do for his wife, attention, affection, appreciation. And he speaks about appreciation, and you need to appreciate your wife all the time or show appreciation at least once a day for something that she does. Try to show her once a day appreciation. With, and it doesn't have to be the same thing. So if you thank her today for your laundry, and if you thank her tomorrow for the food, and you thank her the next day for your companionship, and you thank her the next day for something else that she does for you, whatever it is, like, you know, she took out the garbage so the house doesn't smell. I, I don't care what it is. It doesn't get stale. But if every day you walk over to your wife and you say, thank you for being my wife. Thank you for being my wife. Thank you for being my wife. Your wife's going to say to you, like after day four, day five, what the heck is wrong with you? Well, I'm saying thank you to you. What are you doing? Who told you to say thank you like that? Yeah. It was once a, there was once a story where the rabbi said that people need to be nicer to guests that, came, that come in. So in this community, everybody came over. There was a guest and people came over and said hello. And there was one guy that was a bit of a grouch. And he came over and he said, the rabbi said I have to say hello to you. So I'm saying hello. Yeah. It's not going to get there, you know. That's not what, that's not what, we, we, what gratitude is. But I, I wanted to actually focus on it the other way around. There are some people that show gratitude, and you know and I know that it's fake. Okay? Have you ever had somebody say to you, Michael, thank you so much, and you knew you are so lying to me. 
you are just not telling the truth now when you said thank you. Some people, they have this fake smile. Thank you so much, Michael. I, I don't know how to thank you for everything you've done. And inside, you're thinking to yourself, this guy is lying. I don't know why, or sometimes you can tell why, but I don't care that his mouth says thank you very much. That mouth could be moving and the vocal cords could be saying the words thank you very much. I know and you know what he's really saying is, you're an idiot. I don't really want to thank you. Now, I'm only thanking you because my wife's standing next to me and she'll kill me if I don't say thank you to you now. But I don't want to say thank you to you. you idiot. Yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever he's thinking about you. You've got to be careful, right? You can't have it like that. So that there's two parts to gratitude. Number one, to show gratitude is something you need to do with your mouth. You cannot only do it with your heart because the other person can't feel that, can't take it in. It doesn't become part of them. Number two, if you do show gratitude, oh, Howard, hi, nice to see you. Number two, if you do show gratitude to other people, make sure that if the gratitude is only coming out of here and not coming from here, be careful with that. Because people aren't stupid. And people can easily hear and feel your intentions and your emotions. And if you're actually lying and you're actually saying thank you and in reality you don't mean thank you, then some, sometimes it's even more, do you not find it sometimes more insulting if somebody thanks you and they don't mean to say thank you than if they don't thank you? You know, I've had it at times, I know this is a bad example, but I've had it at times where people have... Uh, sort of, I don't know, offered you a tip, wanted to give you a present, something like that. You know, and somebody says to you, Michael, you know, you took care of me so well. You know, your, your care as an optician is just second to none, and I really wanted to give you this bottle of wine. And he hands you the bottle of wine that you know and I know is £3.50 in Tesco. Yeah, I've had it. I've, I've been to places where, or I've spoken somewhere and they said, Rami Eisenberg, as a token of our gratitude to you, we'd like to present you this safer. Now, I took the safer, very nice. I looked at it and I'm like, no, no, not sort of my style. Okay, whatever. I'll just take it to the shop because the, the, the books come with a, a sticker inside in this country, right? So you can go back. I know it comes from my safer. So I go back to our safer and I say, look, I'd like to exchange this. This one really doesn't take my fancy. I, I, you know, I've always wanted to have safer. A, you know, what are you going to give me for it? They had a look and go, £4.20. I'm like, what? £4.20. And I'm like, but I just spend an hour at a school giving up my time and spend probably another half an hour, an hour preparing, then don't give me a safer. But for goodness sake, why did you give me a safer? That's four pounds. It's just embarrassing. It's really, you feel, do you know what I mean? You feel, under, you feel a lot more underappreciated from a bad gift than from no gift. Because if it's no gift, then I say to myself, you know what? The school wanted, they're just asking me as a favor, as a communal rabbi to speak for them. And I, as a communal rabbi, am willing to do them that favor. Fine. Right? And we both have an understanding that this is a favor. But if they say, no, no, we're not taking this a favor. We want to show you our debt of gratitude. We want to show you a great thank you. And then to thank you, they hand you something of zero value. Then the thank you itself says that you don't really appreciate me. Because if you did appreciate me, you'd spend money on buying something. Or you'd say, you know what? I'll give you nothing, which is also fine. Don't need to get money every time I open up my mouth. Don't need to get a present every time I have this. Please, I, I, right after this, I'm going to be speaking, and then I'm not getting anything for it. And I'm happy, you know what? Because I'm going to be helping singles uh, to try to see how they're going to cope with Yom Tif. I'm very happy to be able to do that. And, and, and I don't need to be paid for it. But if they then say thank you, and they send you something that's worth a pound, you sort of feel like... Oh, and that's why when you say thank you, if you don't feel it, if you don't really mean to say thank you and you're just saying it because you have to, maybe sometimes it's better not to say thank you. Because it's better that way. But you have to teach people to say thank you and to mean it when they say it. Okay, that's number one. Number two. Um... We have over here, I'm trying to see which one of these things I should say. A lot of these things are very good. 
Not my ideas, all of them are ideas from other people, but, but the very good ideas that I like to share with you. So you have to, you have to be judicious which one of them you're going to share, but they're all, they all come across very, very nicely. Okay. Um, so Rav, uh, Rav Hirsch says, you go through this whole Pasha, actually this, this Pasha of Bikurim, and you get to the end of it, so we, we say what we read in the Haggadah, Rami Ovid Avi, my, my father was pursued by love and Arami, and by Yeh Mitzrayim, we went to Mitzrayim, by Yoh and Shem they lived there with small people, then they became a great nation, and the Mitzrayim were not nice to us, and God did tremendous miracles and took us out of Mitzrayim, brought us to this place, gave us a land which is flowing with milk and honey, now he I brought the first of my fruits, Hashem, which you gave me Hashem. you put it down if Hashem before Hashem, and you will bow down if Hashem And then he finishes off. You should be happy with all the goodness. The goodness that God gave you to you and to your household. you and the Levi and the proselyte that is amongst you. That's what you should do. You should be happy with all the... After you bring the Bikurim, you should be happy. So Rav Hirsch says that there's a double thing going on over here. We're speaking about, this is the second double thing we're speaking about tonight. On the one hand, he says, looking at the past gives you simcha for now. Right? Do you want to have simcha now? you want to have happiness now? Look at the past, and the past is almost always guaranteed to give you happiness, specifically if you look at the past. And you say to yourself, we had a, we had a rough beginning. We had to go through the Arami of Iravi. We went through Love and Harami, who wasn't easy to deal with. We went to Egypt. That wasn't easy. Things were very, very hard in Egypt when they enslaved us. God took us out. He took us through the desert. He took us into this land. We were able to conquer this land. And now... <laughs> No, that wasn't now. Now, now I didn't want to say now the crescendo is that I blow my nose. And now, sorry about that. That was, a, that was sort of like at the wrong point. You know, sometimes you just do the wrong things at the wrong point. So I was at the wrong point. And now, God has given me all this wonderful stuff. And I look back at that. And I give, you, you know, you want to have simcha now? You need to look back at the past and see how far have I come? And if you look back at the past and can see how far you've come, that gives you a tremendous amount of happiness. It's a very, very beautiful thing. But on the other hand, you also now looking at the present gives you a perspective on the past. Okay? So what we're trying to do is looking at the past to be able to give you a happiness as you go ahead into the future now. And you want to look at the present now to give your perspective of the past. You look at the present now and you say, look what we have. Oh, wow. Look how far we've come. Yeah? Look back at that. Look how far we've come. Look how good things are now. And it's a double-edged sword. Number one, having a perspective of exactly what the past was by looking at everything now. And number two, having simcha today because you look at the past. So that's the second idea. The third idea that I wanted to share with you, comes from the next bit. So the next bit you have, just to give you an introduction over here, there was something called Vidui Masras. Vidui Masras means that at the end of three years, you had to give, a, a, you had to give two types of tithes, or three really. So you gave Masa Rishon, the first tithe, which went to the Levi. And after that, for two years, you had had Masa Sheni, which was the second tithe that you had to bring up to Yerushalayim and you had to eat all the fruit there or you could convert it to money and eat all that, eat up whatever it is for that monetary value in Yerushalayim. And in the third year, you had Masa Oni. You used to have to give a tithe to a tenth. You had to give to the poor person. And at the end of three years, you had to make sure that you got rid of all the money that you had left over. You couldn't have any money saved up and said, well, I'll use it next year, a year, the year after. No, you have to get rid of it. So at the end of the third year, once you got rid of all those tithes, once you got rid of everything else, you say, then you say, I got rid of all the Kodesh, everything that is holy from my household, i.e. I got rid of all this master, and I gave it to the Levi and to the Yosom, to the orphan and the almona to the widow, like you commanded me, I didn't go against your mitzvahs, I didn't eat it when I was an onen, if somebody had passed away, my family didn't eat from it, 
and I didn't take any of it and make it tome, and I didn't use any for the maize. Shamati, I listened mekayla Hashem lekay in the voice of what Hakadosh Baruch Hu has asked me to do. Osisi, I have done kichal Hashem itzivisami. So it seems to be almost a repetition over here. I go through a whole list of things that I didn't do with it, which is all the commandments that God told me, and then I finish off and I say, Shamati, I listened mekayla Hashem lekay to what God has asked me to do. Osisi, I did kichal Hashem itzivisami. But again, I've already told you that I've done all these mitzvahs with it. So why do I have to say that I've listened to everything God said? So Rashi says, Shemati b'kol Hashem l'kaya, I've brought it to the base of Megdosh. O sisi k'chol ha'shet tzivisoni, I did what you commanded me. And here comes the crux of it, very interesting Rashi. So machti, I was happy. Vesimachti bo, and I made others happy with it. That's the bottom line, after everything. O sisi k'chol ha'shet tzivisoni, I've done what you've commanded me to do. And then we say, Ashkif of Memorand Kachaka, look down from your heavenly place in Shemaim and give us blessings to us and the land that you've given us, like you've promised our fathers, Eretz Zavas Chal Rosh, a land given to our, a, a land flowing with milk and honey. So I was wondering this whole thing of Sisi Kachachachach, I did what you commanded me to do. What does it mean? Samachti, I was happy with Simachtiba, and I, I gave other people happiness. So there's a, Translation, not really translation, is a commentary on Rashi known as the Mizrahi, written by Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Elio Mizrahi. Nothing to do with the Mizrahi movement of, of, of modern. Lived well, well before. They lived like in the 1500s at the time of the Maharal of Prague, similar times. Okay? Very, very early commentator on Rashi, one of the earliest. And he says, Osisi Kolajazani, Rashi is bothered over here by the fact that I've already mentioned to you all the things that you need to do. We've already said all the mitzvahs. So once I've already mentioned all the mitzvahs, I didn't eat it when I was Tomei, and I gave it to the Ger, and to the Yosem, and to the Amona, and I didn't eat it when I was an Onain. I, I gave, I, I've already gone through a list of things uh, that I was supposed to do that I did. So if I've gone through all those things already, why am I now again going through and saying, Shamati, I listened to what you said, Osisi, and therefore Rashi says, Shamati, because Shamati has to be something else that we haven't mentioned yet. What is it? Bringing it up to Beis HaMikdash. Osisi, because I did as you commanded me, that's me again, something else that we haven't mentioned yet. What would that be? So I would be happy, Vesimachti, And I found it a beautiful idea that if I say, O oh, Sisi, I did, I did what you commanded me to do. What did Hashem command me? What does He want? You know what He wants out of this mitzvah, similar to what we spoke about last week, about with the Maka, the idea. Do you know why God wants me to do this mitzvah? Somachti, He wants me to be happy. Vesimachti, and to make other people happy. You want to know what the purpose is of this entire thing? God wants you to be happy. God didn't give you the Torah and the mitzvahs to make things difficult on you. Oh, goodness gracious, I have to go ahead and have to schlep all this stuff up to Shalim, have to eat in Shalim, and God says, I'm doing this because I want you to be happy. I'm doing this because I want you to understand the beauty of Yushalayim, the Kedush of Yushalayim, what Yushalayim means, what it should mean for us, etc., etc. I want you to take this food and to bring it up to Yushalayim to be able to give happiness to other people. You've been given certain physical, you know, wealth or other physical um, benefits so that you can share them with other people. So that they can be not only for me, they're really for everybody. So at the end of everything, once I've discussed all the mitzvahs and all the details, God says, okay, that's all the details of everything. The detail was I gave it to this one and I ate it there and I didn't make it tome and I didn't use it to pay for tachrich from a dead person. That's all the details. What is it really that you commanded me to do? What did you want? You wanted for me to be happy and you wanted me to make other people happy with it as well. When you get to the bottom line, 
That's what it is. And sometimes people get so stuck in on all the detail that they forget about the greater picture. So the greater picture here is not that I didn't eat it when I was tummy. That's the detail. The greater picture says what? It says I was happy and I took that happiness and I made other people happy as well. That's the main thing. So when I finish off and I've mentioned all the details and I've said everything already, I recoup and I recap everything and I say, you know what I did with it? I was happy with it and I passed on that happiness to others. That is what I did with it. And if I've done that, I've done everything that God wants for me. Last idea that I wanted to share with you tonight, an idea that Rav Schwab gives. I think it's a very interesting idea. I, I know some people won't agree with this idea, but it's, it's definitely not a, uh, I, I don't know if it's a mod, in modern parlance if this is such a great idea. So we have... The, before we have the tochacha, before you have the rebuke, you actually have brochus. Kodesh Baruch Hu gives all these blessings. And you're doing everything right and you're doing what you're supposed to do and there's going, you're going to have plenty and you're going to have all sorts of great, great blessings, physical blessings. And then one of those blessings that we are, that's passed on to us is the following. Yitain Hashem es oivecho hakomim alecho. God will take your enemies that rise up against you. This is verse, 20, verse 7 in chapter 28. Barak Chofches Pasuk Zayin. Nigofim lefanecho. They will be smitten before you. Bederach echad yetzer elecho. And one way they will come out towards you. Veshivadrach minusam alecho. And they will run away in seven directions. It's going to be a mess. People are going to be so afraid of you. It's going to be, a, it's, ah, it's going to be great. So that is what the Gemara said. Well, that's what the Pasuk says. And Rav Schwab says, I don't understand. If you are such a great person, and the entire Jewish people are such great people, and they have blessing, and they have goodness, and their fruits grow, and they have uh, everything's amazing. Why would you have enemies? Where are these enemies coming from? And so he says something that I found very interesting, very telling almost. And, and I wonder, again, as I said, I wonder if in modern thought this is something that people actually agree with. He says there are always, that the bad will always oppose the good. The bad will always find a way to fight the good. You represent the good at this point. And therefore, there are people out there who aren't good who will hate you for the fact that you are good. And people might say, oh, come on, is that really true? So I'll quote to you. You don't normally quote this. But we'll quote, I think, from Mein Kampf. It's not a place to quote from, is it? Yeah? But in Mein Kampf, as far as I remember, Hitler writes, the Jews have brought upon the world two terrible things. Number one, in the flesh, i.e., talking about Brismila. Number two, coming from Hitler, listen to this, they have given the world a conscience. Ha, huh. how about that? Coming from somebody who obviously didn't have much of a conscience. They've given the world a conscience. This is evil looking at good and saying, I hate goodness. I hate people that stand for the right thing. I believe in the wrong things. I support the wrong things. And those people that are good make me sick. And that's what, that's what it is. You have to know, sadly, there are people out there that aren't good people. And they will oppose. Now, I'm not pointing at anybody in specific, in particular. And that's on purpose. Right? We're not pointing to people and saying, those are bad people, those are bad people. But there are bad people out there. 
There are people, you know, when people say, I believe everybody deep down is good. Not everybody deep down is so good. Some people deep down are pretty evil. They believe they're good, but they're, you know, I don't know, Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il, two of them. I don't think anybody would say they're great people. They're good people. They might think they're good people. They might think they're doing tremendous things for, for Korea, but they're crazy. Really, deep down, they're absolutely mental. Yeah? And the people like that. There are enough other people. And they will oppose goodness. They will look towards goodness and they will say, this is wrong. This is something that we don't believe in. This is something that we fight and that we must battle and we must go against. As we had that quote from Hitler, Yimach and that's why it says Rav Shwam, there will be people that will look at your success. There will be people that will see all the goodness that you have. And there will be people that will see that you actually are good people and they will dislike you for the fact that you are good. Which is strange. Because you'd expect people who are good to be the most popular people. But not every good person is as popular like that. And that's the idea. You have to know, and this is very important, evil will always oppose goodness. That's the nature of evil. Evil opposes goodness. And therefore, you have to know. Sometimes you see somebody who's really, really good and he's got such sorrows from certain people, you think to yourself, because they don't appreciate the goodness in him. They might represent the other side. They're just on the wrong side of the fence. They might think they're doing good things, but they're on the wrong side of the fence. And sometimes that's the only way to explain it. That's the only way to understand why certain people have such sorrows and they have people against them. They're too good and certain, peoples don't like, some, certain people don't like good people. That's not their thing. Their thing is evil. Their thing is destruction. Their thing is bad. And that's what they thrive on. We need to be people that thrive on goodness. And if we can be people, and we are people that thrive on goodness, that's what, we, you know, that, that's what makes us special. Okay? Thanks very much again for joining me. Thank you for two of you, Malcolm and Howard, joining me. Thank you to those who join me on Twitter anytime. If you want to get in touch, please, uh, you can email me at dovideisenberg at gmail.com. Thank you.